Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel-Rubel and this is One on One, Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Dr. Ayelet Hoffman Lipson taught at Matan for over a decade. She is currently a senior lecturer at the Harry Radzner School of Law at the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya. Ayelet is a graduate of Matan's Advanced Talmud Institute, as well as the Beit Marasha program in Jewish law. She is also the author of Law and Self-Knowledge in the Talmud, a wonderful book that we'll speak about later in today's episode. Ayelet, it's wonderful to be sitting here with you today. It's wonderful for me too. It's always a special privilege to get to do this with real friends. So I'm really excited to talk about things that when you're sitting next to each other, even in the library, even working on these things, that we don't actually talk about them because we speak about other aspects of our life. So it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Ayala, take us back however far you would like to to your journey into the world of, of serious Torah learning. Where did that start for you? What were some of those those early influences? You know, when I think back really to an early time, to my home, some of my earliest memories are sitting on my father's lap as he prepares the davening for Yamim Noraim. And that wasn't really about Torah per se. I don't think, like, I wasn't, my house wasn't a very learned home necessarily, but there was a very strong feeling um, and emotion of the importance of Jewish tradition. And I think that that really impacted me in a very strong way. Um, and also my mother uh, studied Machshevet Israel before she went on to become a psychologist. So that was also always a big factor in my upbringing. It was because very... she spoke about Jewish thought ideas at home? I don't think she just spoke you were aware so... of it. Yeah, I don't think she spoke so much about, you know, the philosophy that she was learning and that she was interested in. But it was definitely something that I was aware of, that that was something of great value. And... Even, you know, even going further back to my grandparents, again, they weren't people who were very learned, but they very much valued Jewish learning and intellectual journeys in general. My grandfather was a businessman, but he had a correspondence that went on for years with Isaiah Berlin. Um, so it was something that was very important in a way. I always felt that my grandfather was a little bit of a frustrated academic in another world. He could have been an academic and he was very passionate and interested about, um, Jewish ideas and also really read, um, read the Torah very, very seriously. So, you know, one of the stories that we always tell is that, Whenever he would get to the stories of Yaakov and Esav, he always got very upset about how Esav got such a bad rap. Like he was such a good son to, to his father. And in the end, Yaakov triumphs and so unfair. And he even, um, you know, created this association of the protectors of Esav. Um, so he really, he experienced it in a very, very live way. So I'm sure that that had a deep impact on me in general. Um, I was also very privileged to be able to study Torah, you know, in a relatively serious way for elementary school at a very young age, because I went to one of the only schools where boys and girls studied together Talmud from fourth grade, I believe. What schools? Um, that was in Efrata at the mm, time. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's not like we had six hours a day, but, you know, I, it was something that was clear that it was natural that girls will also be studying, uh, Gemara. We learned, you know, I remember the first perek we learned was Elu Um, so it, it was something that always came very naturally to me. I didn't feel that it was something that was revolutionary at the time. You know, as a young child, it was just obvious that this is what we learn. We learn Torah, we learn, you know, we learn Tanakh, we also learn Gemara. Um, and then I went on to study at Pelech High School. And there, I think that was where I really fell in love with Torah study in a, in a deep way. I mean, the teachers there are just amazing, were yeah. amazing when I was there and continue to be really outstanding teachers. Um, so I studied, uh, Gemara first with Rami Reiner, who's now a professor at Ben Gurion. And, um, I think the person who really made me fall in love with Talmud was Malka Pitelkovsky, who hmm. was my teacher in high school. Yeah. 
Um, and we had a very close relationship and she really, you know, she really brought Talmud alive. She was so passionate about it and, you know, she really connected it to real life issues. That was always something that was really important to her. Uh, and I just became really interested in Talmud. And at the same time, we also had, there was a program at Pelech called the Bet Midrash program where that was more kind of, you know, thinking about specific issues and exploring them through Jewish philosophy. So two of my amazing teachers there were Moshe Meir and uh, Avinoam Rosenak, who I'm now also privileged to call a chavruta. We have a study group of Rabbi Nachman, and now, you know, we're studying together as peers. But they, they were really people who, you know, opened my eyes to the depth of Jewish tradition. And I think since then, it was basically obvious to me that this was something that I wanted to become involved in, you know, and then I went on to a year of Midrasha before the army. Then uh, after the army, I came back to Lindenbaum. I was planning to only be there for Elul. And then my plan was to go and study art in Italy because I was thinking of maybe start studying art in university, but I just couldn't tear myself away. I just kept staying another month and another month at Lindenbaum. I did eventually go to Italy, but I spent a good six months at Lindenbaum. And that was also a very significant experience. Um, did you always feel encouraged on that path? Did you feel supported, uh, whether it was by your family or, or those around you at that time? Yeah, I think, you know, at first I didn't really think of it as a profession. It was just something that I loved to do and it was mm -hmm. a passion. I never experienced, you know, a sense of like, this isn't going anywhere, you're a woman, there will be many barriers. I never remember encountering that discourse until much later hmm. in my uh, okay. professional trajectory. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I do remember my parents saying, okay, you know, for your first degree, you should study something you love. And for your second degree, you should, you should, you know, become a professional in something that you can support yourself. But at some point, it just became... A sign that they are not Israeli, by the way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as a, I just kind of, you know, I went, it, it, it all went very fast, basically. I mean, I, I, went, I went to university. I, at first, I thought that this wasn't really what was for me. And so I kind of finished my degree up very quickly and started here at Matan in the Advanced Talmud Institute. And then I was offered a fellowship for an MA as well. So I kind of did that while I was doing um, Matan. And then and I decided to do my PhD as well. And by then it was kind of obvious that this was the track that I was taking and that it could, it could become a profession as mm -hmm. well. And it was clear that a PhD would be the next step in that process? So, you know, it's really interesting. I never thought about doing a PhD. My father actually started a PhD in Jewish education and never completed it. So for many years of my childhood, it kind of seemed like this huge mountain that he was trying to get over and didn't happen. So a PhD seemed to me like a really, really, really big deal. And I never thought that I would become an academic. But um, what happened was that my my husband wanted to go abroad to New York to do his uh, graduate work there. Um, and I was sort of at the point that I was debating what to do. And Brian Alivi, who taught here for many, many years at Matan, said to me, you know, men have rabbi in front of their name. Women need doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of helped me make up my mind that, you know, it's also yeah. both like the professionalization, being able to spend many years in a specific setting of going deep into some subject matter, and also the question of, you know, being authoritative. Um, that was also something that was important to me that I, you know, would be able to see myself and others would see me as, a, as an expert in the field. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was clear also that it was going to be Talmud as opposed to, let's say, Halakha. Yes. I mean, I thought that I would do my PhD and then come back to the Torah learning world, basically. While I was doing my PhD at NYU, I also continued to teach. I taught at Drisha there for, for two years. Um, and that was how I saw my trajectory. So um, what I was interested in at the time when I went to NYU, I thought I would write about the relationship between Halakha and Agadah in the Talmud. Um, so I went to study with Jeff Rubinstein, who's the leading expert on Talmudic Agadah, and Moshe Halbertal, who was my MA advisor in Israel, 
also teaches there in the law yeah. school. So he kind of said to me, okay, Jeff will be the agada, I'll be the halacha. I didn't end up writing on that at all. I ended up writing on something else entirely. My interest developed, but it's still something I'm very interested in, and I teach classes on that subject as well. I'm curious how you feel that all these years of Torah study, which in, in the future also led into time in Beit Marasha, where you did more intensive halachic, halachic study, how you feel it has informed your your religious persona or your religious perspectives? So I think that studying Talmud specifically has given me a sense of how often a debate in the Talmud is actually a debate about different values. Mm. So it's not that the Talmud says one thing and then that's, you know, encoded in the Shulchan Aruch, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how Jewish law works. Actually, when you learn a Talmudic sugiah in depth, then you see that the argument is actually because there's different rabbis who are bringing different values to the table and what develops is a conversation between those values. And then if you identify those values, you can see them coming up again and again in responsa and in psika. And that's definitely impacted the way that I think about what it is to be a religious person, meaning I don't think it's just about uh, this is what we do, and that's it. You know, it's it's very much about thinking about how our practice encapsulates and expresses different values, mm -hmm. and also understanding that the flexibility of of halacha, of what it is to be a religious person, um, because you know there are different situations where different voices that were originally sounded in the Talmudic sugya and continue throughout the ages should be applied. Um, or voices that got thrown out. Also true. Unfortunately, but, you know, sometimes. Sometimes they've been thrown out. Sometimes yeah. they can kind of be vivified. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's a very profound way of living that the fact that religion basically circumscribes every part of our life of, you know, how we live from the moment we wake up until we go to sleep and even how we sleep in a way. That's an expression of ideas and values. It's not just abstract idea of, you know, this is the divine word and this is what you should mm -hmm. do and you need to be obedient. But it's really a way of bringing values into our most mundane parts of our life. As you're moving through the world of higher learning, whether it's in the academy or it's in the Beit Midrash, when you come back to uh, to Israel and go to Beit Marasha, uh, I'm sure throughout all those years, and as you evolved in those roles and in, in, in those worldviews, that we begin to see the religious world uh, in a way that, that evolves as well, perhaps sometimes critical. And I'm curious to hear, what are some things that you would like to see change in the future or a phenomenon that maybe frustrate you, whether it's specifically in regard to women and, and our role in Orthodox Judaism or, or beyond just the role of women? I mean, I think on a basic, very basic level, one of the big struggles of our generation is, you know, the place and the role of women in religious society. Um, for me, on a personal level, I think that, you know, I would like to see just more opportunities open for women in a way that is not something that we need to justify or talk about, but it's just something natural and obvious. And I think this starts at a very young age. I mean, I look at my children today and I see how from second grade, um, boys are learning a lot more Mishnah and then Talmud and Halakha. Uh, than the girls are in the same, you know, in the same schools. Um, and what kind of messaging that is sending to them that is very hard to overcome later on. Yeah, it's a very strong blueprint very early on. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I remember when I was 20 years ago, you know, we would dream about a high school for for girls where, you know, like a yeshiva high school where they learn Torah all morning. And now that's a reality that's actually yeah. starting to happen. Please God, next uh, year, Next right? year, yes, thanks to Miriam Reisler. Um, but it's also made me realize now as I look at my girls who are approaching high school, um, how much this actually needs to start happening even at a younger age. 
Um, and I think that, you know, I think it's, 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 I don't think there's a simple solution because, you know, as someone who's experienced co-ed schooling in the States, sometimes I think that that's the solution that we just need to have, you know, co-ed schooling across the board and that so that's the standard is the same for both men and women. Yes. Yeah, but, boys and girls. but I think that there's also, there are also other issues that arise from that. And as someone who's studied in Batei Midrash for women, I also know, you know, what a special environment it is to be able to only, to study only with women. Um, so I think that that's something that we, we need to grapple with. We can't ignore it. And I think that as more opportunities open, you know, later, uh, sorry, earlier on in life, um, that will just make other other questions that you know we have our generation has struggled with at a later age, like leadership in the religious community, um, psika by women, all these issues. Uh, I think that they'll just be resolved more easily because it will just be obvious that women have a lot to contribute to these conversations, and that it's a language that comes naturally to them because they were exposed to it at a younger age. Right. Where language will only be more natural when it is exposed to it at a younger age. Exactly. Um, so you know, obviously, I would like to see more women's leadership, and I would like to see women involved in the uh, higher echelons of uh, of religious life. But I'm not actually sure that the way to approach it is to start at the top. I think mm -hmm. that really what we need to yeah. be doing, and in a way is even easier, is to be starting from the bottom. And maybe it needs to be a two-pronged approach because, you know, young girls need to have role models of what they can achieve. So it's something that needs to happen at the same time. When you made that shift into a more academic direction, which you described before that it wasn't necessarily intentional in the sense that you wanted to be an academic later on. How, how did that work for you? How did, how were you able to join the two together? Uh, we know already from your bio that you are, uh, that you are a professor in a university. And so I'm curious to, to ask how that went for you, because very often in the story you told before about, about Dr. Levy, that women feel limited in their Torah role also because how many jobs are there out there, right? Or whatever sentence we complete for ourselves when we're contemplating our career track. And, and often the sentence will be, well, it's just easier and more available to possibly go and get a doctorate and there will be perhaps more options available to you. I certainly know that's something my father said to me from a very young age. And so I'm curious how, how that worked for you and where, where did you feel internally uh, at peace with that? Did you feel like it was a choice that you had to make that you were able to make? So first of all, I think two things happened while I was doing my PhD. The first was that I stumbled upon a fellowship run by Professor Suzanne Stone at YU, which was a fellowship on, basically it was intended to make legal theory accessible to scholars of Jewish studies. And that had a really big impact on me because in contrast to classical Talmud study that I had been exposed to before, which was very focused on history and on the sources of the text itself, um, this was a way of thinking about the same text that I was interested in, in a much more conceptual, theoretical way, which actually I felt was more familiar to me from the Bet Midrash. Mm -hmm. So it kind of um, created a road for me to think about, you know, what I loved from the Bet Midrash, thinking about the ideas in the Talmudic text while still being within the, the academy. So that was one thing that happened. And the second thing that happened was that I did hit a certain glass ceiling. I had kind of started thinking about becoming more involved in communal leadership. And there was something that I was involved in that, you know, didn't work out. And, and, and I felt that it was very much a question of gender and of what we expect women to represent in the religious world. And I didn't want to kind of fit myself into a certain box. I just wanted to be me. So those two things coalescing together made me feel that maybe I should consider academia more seriously than I had been considering it before. And I think that that is really, you know, first of all, I should say that I don't see myself as kind of a pure academic. I do certainly see myself coming back to teach in the Bet Midrash, you know, maybe when I have tenure, maybe, maybe before, but I'd certainly hope to be able to 
be, you know, one foot in the academy and one foot in the Bet Midrash going forward. And being with a community of learners of of De Hashem is something that I certainly miss in the academy. But on the other hand, I think that one of the things that really drew me to academia, or maybe two things, one thing is the ability to go into depth. I think if you're if you're maybe like a Rosh Yeshiva or maybe even a Ram in a male institution, maybe you have the time to not just be, you know, preparing shiurim every week and you have the time to really go in depth into a certain idea or a certain text that you want to. But even for Rashi Yeshivot, I think it's yeah, not so easy. They're also lacking they're also lacking that that yeah, that it's open just space. it's just, you know, like that's the nature of chinuch, that mm-hmm. you're you want to be in contact with the students all the time. And so maybe if you have a sabbatical, you can take a year and and really go in depth into something. But academia affords that opportunity to really explore certain texts or certain ideas in a depth that I felt, you know, I wasn't able to achieve in the in the Torah world. And I feel it now also, you know, I often teach now kind of like one off classes And whether I'm teaching on something that I've researched, which then obviously, you know, I feel like I have a lot of depth and what I talk about in class is only a tip of the iceberg in terms of what I've, what I've explored already, or even just having more time to prepare a shiur on something that's not necessarily part of my research, but it really allows me to, you know, be able to give more depth, to be able to connect the ideas of the Torah to broader ideas that I'm reading about in other cultures, in theory, in philosophy, in legal theory. I think that that's something that has a lot of value for me. And the second point about academia is that I think that academia is really a place that where the ultimate value is truth. And that that was something that was very, very important for me to be able to you know, explore the texts on their own terms. And Specifically Jewish texts. Yes, yeah. Jewish texts. You know, to be able to acknowledge that these texts were created in a certain culture yeah. and to learn about that culture. And for me, that only makes me value Chazal a lot more to be able to see what they were contending with in the yeah. Roman world or later under the Persian Empire. I really feel like it makes their words sometimes shine like a like a pearl that before was just dull. And now when I understand the context, then I understand their 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 words in a lot more depth. And also for me as a value, you know, Chotomoshel HaKadosh Baruch Hu Emet. I feel I feel that learning Torah is something that requires that intensity of of pursuing what's really true. You know, what did these texts really mean for for their own time? So for both both of those reasons are, you know, something that's really added a lot of value for me to academia. So what you're saying is that initially there definitely was a part of you that went into academia there was a gender piece there of I feel that here I can excel more and there's more doors open to me. But what it's brought you to is a is a value system that you feel has greatly enhanced your life and has come back within the religious fold and also brings so much more than what you might have gotten if you're just stam taking a Gemara without dividing it up into all of its pieces and all of its layers and take it, getting all the different values that are emerging from the different uh, different opinions there. So it's sort of come together in what sounds like a beautiful prism that just has many different openings to it. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think if I would have been a man, I always say if I if I was if I was a man and an American, I would have been a puppet <laughs> rabbi, but I'm neither. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I said that. I also said I'd be a puppet rabbi and a psychologist. <laughs> So I certainly, you know, one of, I think one of the things I miss more being ensconced in the ivory tower is that I don't work with people so much yeah. on, you know, what's, what's concerning people on a daily basis. What are the things that are troubling them? How can Torah be an answer to those things that people are struggling with in their daily lives? But, you know, Bezrat Hashem, now my kids are still young, Bezrat Hashem, when they'll grow up a little bit and I'll have a little bit more time then I hope that I will be able to integrate both academia and those more communal aspects in a fuller way. 
Um, I, I really hope so as well. And I think that before you spoke about really influential people who are today really big academics or, or just tremendous Torah teachers taught you in high school. And that's always this great reminder of how important it is to invest in high school students, even though it's really difficult sometimes for people who love the text itself. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a very difficult, I've tried to do it and I just am not good at it. And, but you're also speaking to the fact that even those who make it into the ivory tower can always come back or come else or, or, or dip their feet somewhere else as well. And then everybody will benefit. And it doesn't have to be that these worlds are separate, but that everybody is giving to each other. I mean, it is golden when you're able to take that time in the library. I, I think back now to my years sitting in the library also next to you and, and I had, and they were very not peaceful years for me personally, but there was such peace there in terms of how much time I could devote to it. And now I'm coming with my, how do you say it in, the, in regular English, right? My tongue is out of my, I'm coming yes. with no breath. I'm coming breathless to Shurim because you're just preparing and you don't have that space and, and you don't have that that laboratory of thought that you can that you can have there. And it's not just thought. For those of us for whom our mind is is powerful like you're describing it's it's our whole selves it's our mind that's connected to our hearts and we may express it in writing or through academic ideas but it it encompasses so much more of who we are as people than just what our mind produces in that space right and i, I certainly also i see a academia as a public resource. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's really crucial for academics to see it as their duty to give back to the community. So, you know, like now I'm still I'm still at the beginning of my academic journey, but during the corona year, I realized, you know, how imp I just needed more contact with people. So I went back to giving more shiurim and, you know, just like on an average week, this week I'm giving a shiur tonight in uh, Brazil by Zoom. And, you mm. know, I'm part of a, I teach on a rotation, a Dafyomi group. So that allows me a little bit more to feel that, you know, that I am connected to other people and I'm giving back from the, the time that I'm allowed to, to kind of deepen my learning and then give it back to other people. Wow. So on that note, I want us to hear a little bit about what you've written about, uh, specifically in the book that you've published. Um, I have to tell you that I had a lot of fun also having a chance to read more of it. And it's it's very accessible. And I'm saying that in a complimentary way, not not oversimplified, but it's really, really accessible. And so I encourage anyone who has minor interest in these topics <laughs> to uh, to go and read it. Uh, it's called Law and Self-Knowledge in the Talmud and was put out by Cambridge University Press. Uh, it came out three years ago. And you have essentially your thesis, and please correct me if I'm wrong, your thesis is about that in late antiquity, which parallels the period of the Talmud Bavli, that there was an emerging sense of self that comes up that we see in other texts and that you trace some of those manifestations as you see them in different sugiot in, in the Talmud. And I would love if you would illustrate for us, maybe through one example in what you write about what you mean there. Uh, of course, the idea of the emerging self, if it was popular in antiquity, I mean, today it's just oozing from every street corner, right? That is the age we're living in, the selfie and all that comes along with it, some of it for good and some of it depending on your opinions, perhaps for less good. But you really speak about the the beginning of that concept really emerging much more fully in the period of late antiquity. So maybe walk us through one uh, one example from, from what you've written. Okay, so this is actually really fun because it also shows the connection between Beta Midrash and the academia, um, because this is actually an example that emerged when I was teaching. I taught briefly at Midrash at Lindenbaum, and I taught this sugya, and this sugya actually became sort of the the garin, the you know the initial uh, sugya around which I built my whole dissertation. And it's a sugya from Masechet Yoma, which talks about whether a person who is feeling unwell should eat on Yom Kippur or not. And I'm really simplifying things here, but basically there are three positions in the sugya. One says that the person who should make the decision is an expert. And based on some research, I understood that to mean that that's a person who is an expert in both halakha and has medical expertise. And that's the position of the Mishnah. Right. And therefore, this person can make the decision for the patient and can look at a variety of different situations and, and make the decision in each situation. 
The second position, which is found later in the Talmud, is a position which says what's most important is the value of human life. And therefore, whether it's the patient who says he or she needs to eat or whether it's the expert who says that the patient needs to eat, we're always going to err on the more lenient side and um, and allow whoever presents the more lenient position um, to to prevail. Why? Because safek nefashot le'akel. In any case that we have a doubt about the value, about life, about whether a person will live or not, then we're always going to be mekel in that situation. But we also have a later position in the Talmud, which doesn't let it rest at that, that the value of life is the most important thing, but says, no, maybe there are actually situations where there's an even more important value. And that Amora presents the idea that even if there are a hundred experts who say one thing, but the patient says the other thing, we're always going to listen to the patient. Why? Lev yodea marat nafsho. The heart knows its own bitterness. And only the individual really knows what he or she needs, both in terms of physical needs and in terms of the mental or religious needs, you know, the questions of conscience that are um, part of uh, Yom Kippur and what guilt that person is carrying. What kind of atonement they need. Do they really need the fast? In exactly. The of doubt. Exactly. So we see here three different ideas, three different positions that are each pulling in the direction of a different value. One is the value of expertise and standardization in halakha. One is the value of, you know, human life is supreme, which is the value that is eventually codified and is most familiar to us. But also... There's a position that says, you know, there's there could be things that are even more important than both of these values, and that is what the individual needs, what's right for the individual, and basically that the halachic decision can only be made based on the knowledge that's accessible only to the individual. In your work, in which you really focus on the emergence of self-knowledge in, in Talmudic literature, do you see how it has any... Uh, import whether into your your personal worldview or your religious worldview, maybe perhaps about autonomy in religious decision making. Do you do you see how it, it might have had any relevance to your life after just writing about it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't know, you know, if it necessarily affected my life after, but I think that definitely I see how the issues that I'm concerned with, both in my book. And, you know, continue be, to be concerned with in, in my academic research, often center around these questions of personal autonomy within the religious world. You know, I think that one of our, one of the great theological questions of our time is the question of what does it mean to be divinely commanded? Is that a worldview that just assumes that the highest ideal is obedience and subservience, and that actually we're supposed to, you know, limit our our autonomy as much as possible? Or is it a worldview that encourages the idea of autonomy as part of Tzelem Elohim, and that a person should try and fulfill themselves to the greatest extent and have as much choice as possible within the within the religious system? So I think that these are things that, you know, I certainly ask myself on a personal level. I think that these are questions that come up for my children, that come up for my students. Um, and I think that that definitely impacted the very fact that I was interested in this theme of the self and yeah. self-knowledge for my book. And it continues to inform my work now as well. I think also the fact that so much of our religious life for for everybody is is hidden from the world meaning as much as we think about a religious life as having a a visible garb to it whether it's in the shul or or our home but so much of our our choices are all personal they're all personal choices that we live in an age where we define it like that meaning in previous times we didn't speak it. We spoke about religious life as obligation, and it still is obligation. But of course, our generation and those that come after us feel much more that it's an obligation. But we also have an ability to make choices at, at each at each and every moment. And so, when we engage in questions of autonomy, 
it also complicates it. Uh, it complicates it. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's simply when you, when your mind starts to engage in questions about where do my choices begin and where do they end, it adds a layer that I think naturally exists in all religious life, but it's also something that can bring up questioning in spaces where sometimes it would be easier if we were in questioning. I agree, but I disagree that this is something that's new. I think that this is actually something that always existed. And part of you know what I show in my work is that these questions concerned even our earliest yes. rabbis. Um, so you know it's possible that the balance was different. It's possible many things were different. Obviously, I'm not trying mm -hmm. to say that you know there's complete continuity. But what I am trying to say is that these aren't, you know, I think that sometimes when we say these questions are only modern, then we also think we should suppress them, that it's not authentic, mm -hmm. that it's something that we've deviated in some way from a vision of, you know, absolute ob obedience. And I don't think that that was ever the case. Mm -hmm. And that I think that we should actually look for those places where, where rabbis debated these questions in order to be able to find ourselves more within the tradition. Can you please take us through the text you've brought from uh, from the uh, Talmud Bavli and Shabbat and uh, take us through a source that may be, may be known to many in the audience, but I'm really curious to hear what you're going to bring from that. So this is a very famous story about um, Ma'amad Hal Sinai and about uh, the acceptance of the people of Israel of the Torah. So the, the Gemara starts by citing the Pasuk, they stood at the bottom of the mountain. So Rav Avdimi says that um, God held the mountain over the people of Israel and threatened them, basically, and said, if you accept the Torah, great, excellent. If not, this is where you're going to be buried. It's a right? little like the choices I offer my children. <laughs> Here's your choice, but there's only one right choice. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that's very clear here from this source. <laughs> and Rav Achabar Yaakov comments on that tradition and says, Mikan moda'a rabba le'oraita. Moda'a is actually a, 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 a legal term, um, which it, which means that basically when a person commits to something under coercion, they can go and and give a moda'a to the Beit Din and say, you know, what I agreed to, selling my field, for instance, that was under coercion. So it doesn't really obligate me. So what Rav Ahav Yaakov is saying here mm -hmm. is that if this tradition is true about the mountain, well, here's an, a moda'a for all of the Torah, right? We only accepted the Torah because we didn't really have any choice, like Yosefa's kids. <laughs> um, so, you know, we don't really need to be observing the Torah at all. And to that, Rava responds and says, Nonetheless, the people of Israel accepted the Torah later in the time of Achashverosh. As it says, Kimu v'kiblu ha-Yehudim in Megillat Esther. And Rava says, Kimu ma'she kiblu kvar. They affirmed what they had already accepted prior at the time of Mamad Hal Sinai. This time without the threat. Exactly. Um, God's threat, although there was an existential threat. Right, true. Although this verse already appears where there is no existential mm -hmm. threat yeah. anymore. Yeah. And I think that this source really speaks to me very strongly, maybe exactly to these themes that we've been discussing in this conversation, because on the one hand, it's talking about the power of religion and specifically religious law, right? That the fact that we know that everything we do was comes from a divine source is a very, very powerful and strong idea. And also, you know, in a sense, it's also it's also very it's it's an affirming idea, right? Mm -hmm. That we don't have to think too much about all our choices because they were all already given to us by God. But what this source is also pointing out is the problematic of that, right? The fact that people live a life where they feel that everything was coerced, right? What does it mean coerced here? It's not only the coercion of the fact that God's holding the mountain over their heads. I think it's also a more subtle idea of coercion. The very idea that at Hal Sinai, people were experienced revelation, right? Imagine that you experience Mamad Hal Sinai. How can you say, 
how can you not say na right? It's impossible. You're just, you're experiencing God's presence. So of course you're going to take on all of the obligations without really having time to think about what does that include? Or do I want it? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the one hand, that's a very powerful moment in our tradition. And it's essential that it remains in that way. On the other hand, what the rabbis are pointing out here is that since the time of Achashverosh, since the time of Mordechai and Esther, we don't live in that world anymore, right? Perhaps even five minutes after Ma'amad Hal Sinai, we don't live in that world yeah, anymore. But certainly not in Galut. Yes. And, and we live in a world, you know, as we know, Megillat Esther is a Megillah that God's name doesn't appear. God's presence isn't clear to the, to the participants in the Megillah. And that's the world that we live in today. And I think that that's why this moment of Yemei HaShverosh is chosen in this source, because it's actually a, a, a moment in Jewish history that's talking about the hiddenness of God and the fact that we don't live in a world of revelation anymore. We live in a world that's a world of hiddenness. And then the question is, okay, so how do we live with that moment of Sinai in our lives? And I think that what Rava is suggesting is that there's a value in kimu mashekiblu kval, right? There's a, a value in constantly affirming that acceptance again and again, and actually connecting our world in which God is hidden, in which we have a lot more autonomy about our decisions and about how to lead our lives, but we're connecting them back to that moment of Sinai, and we're willingly accepting upon ourselves the coercion of this system of, of halakha, of religion more broadly, of being connected to God in a covenant and in a relationship of commitment. I think that this this source, which is, again, familiar to many of us, that it is, I think, one of the most spoken f- uh, intentions on the part of younger people today. And I'm speaking younger today in high school, uh, that people that I, you know, have a chance to speak to or teach. And there's a real need to want to accept something on your own. Uh, that you can't just say, this is what we do. This is what, this is the sof pasuk. This is the end of the sentence. There is, but they say, no, okay, I know that the halacha says that, but I want to feel that I want to do that. I need, and there are some mitzvot that I think it's far beyond even the past decade or two. I think that there are some mitzvot that have always required because of their tremendous dedication have required a certain degree of that. But certainly today, that standard of I want to have my kibu vikimu is really being applied to almost all aspects of mitzvah observance. Uh, again, everybody in their own amount, everybody in their own degree, but the fact that it's right there in the Gemara from all that time ago of that there's always going to be an aspect of the objective almost, right? Is if the objective reality or that Sinai or that peace that's God-given. And then there has to be, in the reality of the world, a moment where somebody comes and says, I'll meet you there, right? Meaning it's not only that you're going to put it on me, but I'm going to show up. Uh, And I think that it's a psychological process that all humans go through, right? Children go through that as they go through their own psychological development of going from being underneath the very clear authority of their parents to then developing their own authority and then having to make those choices, whether they'll be similar or different from their parents, but make those own choices to show up and receive whatever they're willing to receive. Right. I think Um, that also this source is in a way talking about, you know, there's a certain kind of leap of faith, right? That we can't really ask about each individual detail. Is this well suited for me? You know, do do I take this or do I leave this? But rather, it's a choice to be part of the system as a whole. And then once you're part of the system as a whole, you got to play by the rules. Um, and I think that that's part of what this source is saying, right? Kimu mashe kiblu kvar. They affirmed what they had already accepted. So they, you know, that willingness to put yourself in the game and say, this is, this is my world. This is who I am. And okay, and then maybe there's also parts of it that, you know, I don't understand or parts of it that are difficult for me and are challenging for me. But it's not all about me anymore yeah. because I've entered this system where the whole system is about a covenant between me or between me and the community and God. And therefore, even if there's parts that I don't understand or parts that are hard for me, I'm ready to take that upon myself. 
Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up this conversation. And I wanted to end like we always do with a number of uh, rapid fire questions. Ayelet, are you ready? I'm ready. What books are on your nightstand? Many books, but I'll mention two of them. One is called The Theology of Liberalism. That's a and... good nighttime read. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's good if you want to go to sleep, maybe. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. it, it's basically a book about the philosopher John Rawls. But more broadly, it's about how we think of liberalism as a product of a secular age in the post-Second uh, World War age. But really, some of the central ideas of liberalism you can find in theological debates from antiquity. So I always find that kind of Connecting uncovering. Connecting the old and the new. And yeah, that we're it's really kind not of like a new. mystery novel, yeah. you know, like uncovering oh, wow. ideas that to us are obvious and finding that their earlier sources are in something entirely different. Okay, I love I'm borrowing that. that one. Yeah, and what's the second um, one? And the second one is a book by uh, Jonathan Feintuch, Panim el Panim, mm. where he reads uh, Agadot Chazal in their uh, halachic context. And as I mentioned before, that's something that I we're going to write a doctorate about and that you didn't. Exactly. Um, So, yeah, those are two of some of the books there. Beautiful. If you could sit down with anyone, layman, famous, alive or not, for a cup of coffee, who would it be? I think it would be the Rabbi Milubavitch. What? I wasn't Um, expecting that. I just think he was such an amazing personality and force. And I'm very sad that I was never privileged to to meet him. So I don't know if he would have coffee or schnapps, but <laughs> I'd love to have some with him. What is your favorite tefillah? I think my favorite tefillot are very simple tefillot. Elohai uh, Shama. That's been a favorite, I have to say. Yeah. I love saying Asher Yatzal every time uh, throughout the day. And also a verse that I put on the dedication of my doctorate, but was cut by Cambridge Press when I, <laughs> when I published the book, which I was quite upset about and I should have insisted on. When we take out the Torah and we say the Brich Shmei, so at the end we say, Yeherava de Tiftach Libai Beoraita. You know, may it be your will that you'll open my heart with Torah. So that's an idea that I really love that Torah is not just intellectual, it's something that opens mm-hmm. our hearts. Yeah. Beautiful. Something people think about you that isn't true? Probably that I have it all together. You know, Mm. people often say to me, you know, how do you do it? Five kids, academia, you're teaching here, you're teaching there. And I really do not feel on a day-to-day basis like I have things together, but usually things feel like they're kind of falling apart. Yeah. I Like I say, I'm a big hot mess, but I look put together on the outside. Yeah, I get it. What exotic location would you like to visit? India. Definitely. Oh, can we go together? Yes. Okay. This is a very great trip. <laughs> okay. I'm excited. We planned it. Uh, hidden talents. I don't know if they're so hidden, but I love to sing and I love to cook. And maybe here I should also promote my Instagram account that I'm running with my daughter. Where Ooh, what? I every, didn't know about this. I don't know. Every week we <laughs> cook something for the parasha, either something visual from the parasha or some kind of pun or idea. Uh, so that's pretty hidden, but if you join, then it won't be so hidden anymore. Oh, wow. Okay. Maybe I'll reopen Instagram just to, just to check that out. Um, I'd love to hear, to end this conversation today, something that you're grateful for in your life right now. First of all, for my health, after this very difficult year, I'm glad that I've emerged pretty much unscathed, you know, both physically and mentally. And that's really due very, very much to my family. I've felt Every day this year, you know, even when my kids were driving me crazy, I've thought often about people who don't have the blessing of the family that I have. And it's been so, so grounding. And especially my husband, Adi, who's really been a source of strength during this very difficult period and and overall. So that's something that I'm definitely very grateful for. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I'm sure everyone's going to deeply appreciate this conversation. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel-Rubel, and this is One-on-One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Thank you to Sofia Vindish for producing this episode and the entire Matan team for their input. 
please do one-on-one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, and Matan's website, and write us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.